And yet all them years ago, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had said that that would happen. Ah, uh-huh. knew that would happen, yet it's only happened in the last century, yeah. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing really well, inshallah. Today we are joined with my lovely mom again. Hello, hi. And we are back to do another reaction video. Today we're reacting to mind-blowing prophecies of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So let's begin, inshallah. Arab Bedouin's Prophecy From millennium past, there were two types of Arabs, city dwellers and Bedouins. Bedouins are nomads. They travel through the vast deserts and are constantly on the move. Even during the golden age of Islam, when Arabs were the richest and most learned people on earth, Bedouins remained in virtually the same state that they had been for thousands of years, poor, uneducated, and cut off from the rest of the world. Yet Muhammad, peace be upon him, foretold that these Arab Bedouins of his region would one day compete with one another in the construction of tall buildings. Now tell me of the last hour, asked the man. The prophet replied, that you see the barefoot, unclothed Bedouins competing in the construction of tall buildings. Today we find in the Arabian Peninsula, the Bedouins who used to be impoverished herders of camels and sheep are now not only competing with one another, but also the entire world to construct the world's tallest buildings. How did one of the poorest people on earth, who literally wore rags, become the wealthiest nations on earth? One thing that made this rapid change possible was the discovery of oil. The seemingly empty deserts of the Bedouins had it in abundance. They went from camels to Cadillacs in a single generation. The construction of tall buildings among the Arab Bedouins has even reached Mecca, Muhammad's city of birth. The last few decades have seen a massive surge in building construction in Mecca. The famous Mecca clock tower is currently the third tallest building in the world. In order for such construction to be possible, many of Mecca's ancient mountains had to be demolished in order to make room for the tall buildings that had sprung up. Amazingly, this is also something that Muhammad had foretold. He said, The hour will not be established until the mountains are moved from their places. This tremendous feat of demolishing entire mountains has only been made possible in the 20th century with the advent of technology such as explosives. It's important to point out that Muhammad himself was a simple man and wanted other Muslims to maintain that simplicity. He did not like Muslims to be extravagant. So, if he wanted to will this prophecy to become true, he would have to encourage the Arabs to build tall buildings. Yet, he never did. So that's a really interesting fact because, as you know, across the world, different countries will try to have the tallest building. It was in Dubai for quite a while. Um, it was also in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And yet, all them years ago, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had said that that would happen. Ah, uh-huh. knew that would happen. Yeah, it's only happened in the last century. Yeah. They're in competition with each other across yes. the world to see. And anywhere you go now, it doesn't matter what country you're in in the world, there's skyscrapers everywhere. I know. And yeah. this was never a thing going back to the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. No, no, you can imagine them not being around then. So that's uh-huh. one of his amazing prophecies that yes. he said that that would happen and it has already. Yes, ah. Uh-huh spread of sexual immorality and disease. Muhammad, peace be upon him, revealed that the day of judgment would not take place until sexual immorality had become so prevalent and normalized that it would begin to be carried out even in public places. He said, the hour will not be established until people fornicate with each other in the road, just as donkeys fornicate. Today we live in a world where we are being constantly bombarded with explicit sexual imagery be it in TV, film, or advertising. And with the advent of the internet, pornography has now become readily available at any time in any place. In fact, we are finding more and more stories in the news of people being arrested for having sex in public. And an interesting side note is that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, described what would be the consequences of such widespread sexual immorality. He said, Never does sexual perversion become widespread and publicly known in certain people without them being overtaken by disease that never happened to their ancestors who came before them. The increase of sexual immorality has seen the emergence of previously unheard of diseases such as AIDS, just as the Prophet Muhammad had forewarned. 
you know that even from my lifetime as being brought up as a child and there was nothing like that, nothing. It was always uh, private, you know, and um, I wish we were still like that. I was actually saying to you the other day that Mm -hmm. I was watching a series and it was the first time I'd seen a series in so long that didn't have, like, anything sexual in it because Mm -hmm. nowadays it's just everywhere. Every TV programme you watch, even going out in the street, you'll see billboards up of half-naked people. I know. And it's just, like, so normal now. I know. It but is, it's, isn't it? it doesn't feel comfortable. It's just wrong. It shouldn't be, you know, it's a private thing, isn't it, to But, happen. like, the Prophet, peace be upon him, had said that there'll come a day where people will fornicate in the streets like donkeys, and that'll be a normal thing. We are supposed to be more, more, intelligent, or more intelligent than animals, and yet... Like you say, we're becoming closer and closer to how animals do things. Well, you know, the funny thing is, so in the UK, it's always been a joke that British people are like a bit prude. Prudish. And, Mm -hmm. you know, they don't like that kind of stuff. But now it's changing really, really rapidly. It is. It is. Really rapidly. It is. You're right. You're right. You're, You're hearing... You know, you just in your workplace and stuff, you're hearing yeah. people speaking about and bragging about stuff like yeah. that, and it's awful. A world steeped in interest. Muhammad, peace be upon him, claimed that the practice of interest would one day become so dominant that even those who try to avoid it will still feel its impact. He said, A time will come upon mankind when they will consume interest. Whoever does not take from it will be afflicted by its dust. This clearly describes the state of the world economy today. In the modern world, it is almost impossible to avoid dealing with, or at the very least being impacted by, interest. Just think about how many people have interest-bearing bank accounts, and buy things using credit cards. Even if one somehow manages to avoid dealing in interest directly, almost every aspect of our lives is impacted by it. Central banks influence the purchasing power of our money, and virtually every country in the world, even those considered to be wealthy, are drowning in interest-based debt. The financial system even suffered a global collapse in 2008, a disaster which had plunged the world into economic turmoil, the consequences of which will be felt for generations to come. What makes this prediction amazing is that the financial state of the world over the last century is unique in history. At the time of Muhammad, Finance was based on commodities with intrinsic value, such as gold and silver coins. Gold and silver have been used as the most common form of currency throughout history. The use of paper money with no intrinsic value, along with the massive debt and interest that it has resulted in, is a phenomenon of modern finance, and not something that could have been easily guessed by Muhammad over 1400 years ago. It's hard not to be either end of that, isn't it? Either be the person with money in the bank that's creating interest or or buying a house and needing to pay interest. And, you know, there's not, I don't suppose there's a, a small amount of percentage of the population are able to buy a house yeah. outright, you know. It's a rat race now, isn't it? And if you get left behind, you're going to struggle, aren't you? And I've always been a person that's wanting, wanted to work hard and um, and be able to provide for my family. So without giving in to some of, you know, like basically a mortgage, it is um, hard, hard not to do that. We've done a video on this before where... We've spoken about interest and how it's haram and Islam, and we had a discussion about that. Uh-huh. And it is in this day and age, it's really hard to avoid. I mean, you look at getting a car, a house, you know, a lot of things come with interest. Unfortunately, even car insurance, if you want to pay that up monthly, it's going to have interest on it, unless you paid it in the one or in the year. In this day and age, it's really hard to try and avoid it. I have said to you before, though, that there is Islamic banking where there's no interest involved. So if Muslims, you know, want to buy a house, then there is that option for them. Islamic banking isn't a thing in the UK, though. I was just going to ask you that. I've not heard of that. No, it's um, in Muslim-majority countries, and I I heard Russia as well now do it. Oh, right. So you would... I think you'd maybe pay a higher price. Like, people 
in our last video we spoke about it and quite a few people left comments saying that it's overall a bit of a higher price but there is no interest involved yes for... is there a bank that if you wanted to try and do that would you be able to access a bank abroad then i don't know i've not looked no. into it uh -huh. the defeat of rome and the conquest of persia during the battle of the trench where muhammad peace be upon him and his followers were under siege by their enemies being outnumbered three to one and staring in the face of certain defeat the prophet made some bold predictions. He said, God is most great. I have been given the keys of Syria. By God, I can see its red palaces at the moment. God is most great. I have been given Persia. God is most great. I have been given the keys of Yemen. At that moment, Muhammad had made the astonishing claim that the Muslims would not only take the lands of Yemen and Syria, much of which was under the occupation of the Roman Empire, but that they would also defeat the mighty Persian Empire. Historically, Muhammad's companions saw this prophecy fulfilled before their very eyes, as they went on to defeat the Romans and conquer Persia. What are the odds that the Muslims, who lacked economic and military strength, could topple the superpowers of the world in such a short span of time? The astonishing way that the Muslims defeated the superpowers captured the world by surprise, as historian Barnaby Rogerson explains, you have to remember that the two great superpowers were the Byzantine Empire, i.e. the Eastern Roman Empire, and Sassanid Persia. They were the dominant superpowers. If you're putting it in a modern parlance, it's a bit like the Eskimos taking on the United States of America and Russia. No rational person would have ever conceived of such a possibility. The sentiment is echoed by historians who cannot explain how Islam became such a dominant force so quickly. Professor of Byzantine Studies, Andrew Louth, wrote, The speed with which the eastern provinces of the Byzantine Empire succumbed to the Arabs remains to be explained by historians. I think it was probably determination, and they were physically stronger and more determined the Muslims came along, were, were brave and, um, and could conquer them because of that. Again, their religion and their determination to prove they could, they could stand up. But you, you can know? see the size of them. So they, it was the equivalent of a group of Eskimos compared to America and know, Russia. Three to one. Uh -huh. Yeah, and the size of Russia and America is so uh -huh. you know massive compared to the size of what was back then yeah. with the Muslims. I just think they were probably much more um, competitive and maybe annoyed about what was happening, so they just fought back. You know, but a lot is stronger than everybody on this earth yeah. put together so yeah. with him with behind him behind you, uh, nothing is impossible yeah that's what i was saying with their religion and their belief they believed they could do it and yes with his help but i truly think they believed in themselves so much prevalence of writing many of us take for granted the ability to read and write and the abundance of books that are available in the modern age However, for the people of the past, illiteracy was the norm, and books were very scarce. Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born into a society in which very few people could read or write. It is estimated that the number of people who were literate in his locality of western Saudi Arabia did not exceed 17. Muhammad himself could not read or write. Against this backdrop, the Prophet Muhammad made the prediction that writing will, one day, become widespread among mankind. He said, Ahead of the hour, the pen will prevail. The Arabic word used for pen here is qalam, which also carries the wider meaning of writing. This perfectly describes our world today, in which it is the norm for people to read and write, and there is an abundance of books, newspapers, and magazines. This has only been made possible thanks to 15th century technological advances, such as printing that took place over 800 years after Muhammad's prophecy. And with the advent of the internet, writing is spreading even more. Anybody with a computer or smartphone now has access to millions of books with just the click of a finger. It's quite powerful that Muhammad, who could neither read nor write, prophesied the spread of reading and writing. Going back then, the Prophet, peace be upon him, 
as you know, because we've covered that in quite a few videos, that he was completely illiterate. He couldn't read or write. Yes. Uh, and it was quite a common thing for that time. He said around him, the prophet, was only 17 people that could write. Yeah. So them 17 are going to start multiplying and multiplying and spreading yeah. it and learning from each other. Like we like we do in the modern day now, only it's it's gone at a faster rate, isn't it? Because the world's building and building. There's so many people now. He had the faith and wanted to to pass this on himself, didn't he? And he, he obviously managed to do that as well. This video was about him and his many prophecies that he said going back in this time and how would he have known this unless Allah had passed down this knowledge yes, to him. Yes, yes. So this is yeah. kind of the point of the video that each and every one of these things that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had said has already come true. It's, yeah, it's come through God, hasn't it? To yeah, him. it's been passed through yeah. as he was a prophet yeah. and then that's why he would, you know, share his knowledge as a prophet and all these things have come true. These things have come true and happened because of that because he has um, otherwise made... If there wasn't a God, the, nothing would have gone any further because they wouldn't have had any the information that they need that he needed. The prophet needed. Well, we wouldn't be here yeah. at all. I know. If there yeah. was no God, yes. we just wouldn't yeah. even exist. If there was no God. Uh huh. But there are still some things that we believe will happen in the future that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had spoken about. Yes. A lot of them have come true already, but others we anticipate will happen. Yes, uh -huh. The greening of Arabia's deserts. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made a bold prediction about the future state of Arabia. He said, the hour will not begin until the land of the Arabs once again become meadows and rivers. This narration anticipated the greening of Arabia's extensive dry desert environment. As recently as 1986, there was little to no farming in the region. However, over the last 30 years, these deserts have been transformed to grow grains, fruits, and vegetables, thanks to techniques such as center pivot irrigation. This is a process that pumps water to the surface from deep underground reserves, some of which date back to the last ice age 20,000 years ago. Now put yourself in the position of a person living in 7th century Arabia. This region hosts some of the most extensive sand and gravel deserts in the world, with very little rainfall. Could anyone inhabiting such a harsh environment ever rationally conceive of the possibility that one day there would be a plentiful supply of water and abundant crops? This prophecy also makes a claim about the ancient past. Note the words of Muhammad, the lands of the Arabs once again become meadows and rivers. By saying once again, he is implying that at one stage in their history, the deserts were lush with vegetation and life, and that they will be returning to this former state. Geologists now know that the Arabian Peninsula was, indeed, once filled with meadows and rivers in ancient times. Modern archaeological discoveries have uncovered a number of fossils and conclude that once upon a time, the Arabian Peninsula was much greener and wetter, just as Muhammad had revealed. This is something that I find really, really amazing because Saudi Arabia has just been a desert for many years, uh -huh. hundreds of years. Yes, and uh -huh. now recently there is a lot of, you know, green meadows and grass and a lot of people I've seen on Instagram and things have been to Saudi Arabia and they cannot believe how much green grass there is now. Uh -huh. yes. And this was another thing that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had said. 1400 years ago. I know, eh? it is amazing, isn't it? God has had a hand in that, hasn't he? So they're basically saying, how could somebody that's illiterate know that in the future it's going to be lots of grass and lots of green meadows in Saudi Arabia? He couldn't possibly know no, that. No, no. He couldn't possibly know that unless he had the knowledge sent down to him from God. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And God told him, you know, this would be something that would happen in the future. Yes. There's uh -huh. no other explanation because how could he know all these things were going to happen in the future? No, I know, I know, it is. it's hard to get your head around that, isn't it? Yeah, and understand. The rapid spread of Islam and the decline of the Muslims. 
Muhammad, peace be upon him, predicted that the Islamic civilization would reach both east and west. He said, God folded the earth for me, and I saw its east and west, and the dominion of my nation will reach as far as the earth was folded for me. History bears witness to the fact that Islam spread rapidly, both east and west, just as Muhammad boldly had foretold. At the time, this was a geographic expansion the likes of which the world had never witnessed. The Islamic Empire was the largest the world had ever seen. The Prophet Muhammad not only informed us about the spectacular rise of the Muslims, he also foretold their decline. He said, The nations will call each other and set upon you, just as diners set upon food. Someone then asked, Will it be because of our small number that day? The Prophet Muhammad replied, Rather, on that day you will be many, but you will be like foam, like the foam on the river. Here we can see that Muhammad prophesied the dire circumstances in which the Muslims would find themselves. He explained that a day would come in which the Muslims would be large in number, but in such a state of weakness that other nations would invite one another to set upon them. The analogy of Muslims being eaten as a meal was given, which emphasizes just how helpless they would become. This prediction accurately describes the radical turn of events that took place in the Muslim world in the 19th and 20th century. Prior to this, the Muslim lands had grown to become some of the most powerful in the world. From the time of the death of Muhammad until the 19th century, the Muslims were economically, politically, militarily, and technologically far ahead of most of the world. Then the unthinkable happened. Nearly all the Muslim world was occupied, colonized, and militarily defeated by non-Muslim nations. Russia had annexed the Caucasus. France controlled Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. Great Britain occupied Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Palestine, and India. And the Dutch controlled Malaysia and Indonesia. Of the 50 Muslim countries that exist today, only a few survived occupation and the ones that did were still subject to colonial masters. All of this is just as the Prophet Muhammad had predicted. At the time, there was an estimated 200 million Muslims, representing 12.5% of the world's population. But their considerable numbers could do nothing to prevent the defeat by their rivals. They were weak like the foam on a river. Again, just as Muhammad had foretold. If we reflect on this prediction, it is quite counterintuitive. If this prediction was guesswork, then it would have made more sense to state that the Muslims would be diminished in number and that would be the cause of their weakness. Yet Muhammad predicted the exact opposite, a paradoxical situation of the Muslims being vast in number but very weak. And it came true. Historically speaking, when religions lose their influence on the world stage in such a way, it is usually followed by a stagnation or decline in the number of their followers. Yet Muhammad foretold the exact opposite with regards to the religion of Islam. He said that it would continue to grow in terms of the number of followers, to the extent that it would eventually enter every household. He said, This matter will certainly reach every place touched by night and day. God will not leave a house or residence, except that God will cause this religion to enter it. Today we are witnessing this prophecy unfold before our very eyes. Islam is currently the fastest growing religion in the world, with nearly one in four people on earth being a Muslim, and is forecasted to be the world's largest religion by the year 2070. This is despite Islam being constantly attacked by the media, the colonization of Muslim lands, and the many wars that have been waged in the Muslim world. I've said that to you before that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. Uh -huh. It's the second largest religion in the UK and mm -hmm. they think that it will be the main religion in the UK in the next 20 years. Uh -huh. Yeah, gosh. Uh -huh. Which I can see because there's so many people converting to Islam and actually it's mostly young females that are converting. Yes. Even though the outside world think all oh, women are oppressed in Islam, the people who have actually looked into it for themselves see how well women are respected and treated and obviously something is drawing them towards Islam, so... Yes, uh -huh. I can see that, as, uh, you know, as uh, by going out and about with you and uh, there's so many... Um, yeah, you see so many people with scarves on yeah. that you can identify easily and, yeah, I just see that. Because you, you're in 
Britain and maybe some people think, oh, you might be at risk because it might be seen as not the right thing that, well, people think it's not the right thing you're doing, but it's not like that, is it? Yeah, I mean, I guess there will be some far right people, but me personally, I've not had anybody say anything to my face anyway. No. The hijab is such a common thing for people to see nowadays. I don't really think people are no, that bothered. I, think. I haven't seen a difference anyway. Other females, especially like yourself, will smile at you because it's like um, you're, you're one of them, you know. You've yeah, you've just fitted in really well and it's never been made an issue of, has no, it? No, not at that. all. Like we said there as well, that Islam will enter every single house. Yes. Uh-huh. So somebody within every single household at some point will be Muslim. Yeah, well, I can I couldn't imagine that, yes, because like you say, it's growing and growing, isn't it? Even the name Muhammad has prophetic implications. It's an Arabic word that means the praised one. The Quran states how Muhammad's remembrance will be raised. We elevated your mention for you. Since this verse was revealed over 1400 years ago, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has been the most praised person in history. Today, not a second goes by without a minaret somewhere in the world publicly proclaiming the time for prayer and saying, I bear witness that Muhammad is the Messenger of God. Moreover, the name Muhammad is consistently the most popular name given to newborns across the globe. This is despite the fact that Muhammad never encouraged Muslims to adopt his name. In fact, he said that the best names are Abdullah and Abdurrahman. Now we've analyzed a number of the Prophet Muhammad's prophecies, which were made over 1400 years ago, and have seen how he has accurately foretold many things. Purely from the standpoint of basic probability, for someone to accurately guess about such future events, which spanned across multiple nations in different time periods, many of which were outside the sphere of Muslim influence. To give so many predictions without making a single mistake is utterly impossible. Today, millions of people believe in false prophets and follow false systems for guidance in life. As human beings, we're willing to follow false prophets, man-made systems, and baseless superstitions, but why don't we accept the real guidance when it comes from God? God empowered the Prophet Muhammad with accurate prophecies as a way for us to distinguish the true prophets from the false. Truth has now arrived, and falsehood perished, for falsehood is, by its nature, bound to perish. Well, first of all, I I didn't know that that's what his name meant, the praised one. I didn't actually know that either. No, Uh uh-huh. And also, the, the, the reciting and the... The, the the recitement to to tell you it's time to a call to prayer a call to prayer sorry um ha, has a meaning as well I know I knew it would be something but because you because you don't speak that language you don't yeah. really think about it also in each prayer that we do twice every prayer we would mention Muhammad's name peace yeah. be upon him twice every prayer yeah well he's been chosen hasn't he and he is the one the praised one. It's nice though, isn't it? And I love the sound of that. The call to the prayer. Call to yeah. prayer. It's lovely. It's, um, it almost um, makes you want to just... I would think if you were just a random person near that, you'd want to carry on and go in. <laughs> yeah. And I first ever heard that for myself when we went to Turkey for the first time. So that was... 2018 yeah yeah and I kept hearing as I'd go out on my walks and I do I was besotted by it because it does it ha- it feels like it's capturing you doesn't it a lot it? of yeah. non-Muslims say that as well that mm. they just love the sound of the call to prayer yeah. and it's just so soothing I think and same with the Quran when you hear recitation 
it's so soothing and it's just calming. It's just, it's really, really magical, I would say to you. Yes, I have. I think that video was really interesting. I think it was really well laid out as it well was. with pointers. It was good. It was good. I quite like those when they're split up because it gives you a chance to watch and then speak about it. Muhammad is the most popular name in the world. I knew that. I knew that a few years ago. And I remember I would ask people what's the most popular name in the world and when when you say that to somebody that's british they'll always go david or john yeah, or I know, you know what i mean i don't know it was on a quiz somewhere i heard it or something and there's no it's not it's mohammed you know uh, because it is obviously because it's such a religious name you've yeah. got like mo salah yeah he's mohammed so really, you know mo you know the runner mo 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 farah, mo farah yeah. so he's mohammed yeah. as well Yes. Then there's obviously Muhammad Ali, we did a video yeah. on him. So there's uh -huh. a lot of people that you already know called Muhammad. Yes, I uh have. -huh. If there's any other videos you would like us to react to, please leave them in a comment and we will get round to them inshallah. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, give it a thumbs up, give me a comment, let me know what you think. And we will see you in the next video inshallah. Thank you, bye.